Hello, my name is Scott Stell. Today I'll be talking about comparative cheese making, ex examining the ceramic vessels used in the production of cheese from the Neolithic era and from the Roman era. Ceramic vessels associated with the production or consumption of dairy foods have been found from 7,000 years ago in various parts of Europe, including in Dalmatia and in Poland. Some of the vessels used in ancient dairy making are very obvious on how they're used, such as these examples here from Lydia and Majorca. Uh, the dairy product is poured into the, the strainer, the solids are kept in the vessel, and the more liquid parts drain out. The examples from the sites in Poland are somewhat different, however, as they are funnel shaped with a large hole in the bottom and have drainage holes. So it's not simply a, a funnel to move things from a, a container into a, a narrow neck, but it's also a strainer. And this is a very unusual uh, kind of form. It's, it's rare in most of the archeological record. And I was very curious on how you could use this in the production of cheese. Using the published drawings from the uh, archaeological reports, I made replicas of the of some of the vessels associated with cheese making. Um, on the left, this is an image in in process, and then on the right, the finished pieces uh, fired to an earthenware temperature. There are two sizes that I was able to identify, and I made one of the bowls that's that's documented in the archaeological report. My first trial in the cheese making experiment was to make a uh, what's referred to as a bag cheese or bag type cheese in the bowl like those from the Neolithic. This cheese is not cooked. It uh, sits for roughly 24 hours and then uh, it, it uh, um, coagulates and then gets poured into the strainer. I set the strainer in a, a glass bowl to catch the whey that would come out and poured the, uh, the bag type cheese in and this was not successful. The curd from bag type cheese is uh, very soft and uh, not very strong, does not hold together very well. And I, I did not expect this to work, but I needed a starting point for the experiment. and. As anticipated, this type of cheese production didn't work with this kind of strainer. If you add a cloth lining, uh, it's perfectly effective. Uh, the, uh, the curds are caught in the cheesecloth, the strainer holds the cloth in place, and so this could be how the, the strainers were used. If you're using textile though, you don't need a strainer. The textile works on its own. The textile is a completely separate technology uh, with its own manufacturing requirements. If you're using cloth, you don't need a ceramic strainer. You can just do it with the fabric, as hence the name bag cheese. After using the uncooked curds, I went to heated curds uh, um, on a stovetop, and this is where the the curds are heated more whey is extracted and the the curds hold together quite well the relatively high heat of direct heating meant that a strainer wasn't needed um, the cheese curds just clumped together it could be removed directly from the cooking vessel without being strained to provide uh, close control over temperature uh, i used a sous vide water bath um, to ensure that the heat was even and distributed and did not lead to the, uh, the melting of the curd and clumping as we saw with the direct heat. I knew that the curds needed to be fairly large and uh, that can come from a relatively low temperature. This, um, I went with the technique used for the preliminary stages of making soft cheeses like brie and ended up with 
large soft curds from low temperature heating, and this was quite successful. The whey drained out, the curds remained in the strainer. Overall, a successful experiment. During the Neolithic, they did not have sous vide machines, so I moved on to open fire cheese making. Using the same bowl, I set the, the milk near but not too close to the, uh, the burning material of the fire, so it would be warmed and not overly heated. The curd developed very nicely, uh, just like in the sous vide machine, and I then cut the curd. I returned the bowl with cut curd to the uh, margins of the fire so that it would not be overheated, and this allows the curd to express more whey and have a little more substance. I poured the curd into the strainer from the bowl after a period of time. Um, you can see some very small flecks of wood ash amongst the curd. Just like the previous trial, the uh, curd production was quite successful. It was held in the strainer um, without any difficulty. As you can see here, the larger size of the curd prevented the curd from coming out through the larger opening at the bottom of the funnel-shaped strainer. This is the smaller of the two strainers. As you can see here, the amount of curd produced from the smaller bowl uh, is nowhere near the volume of the strainer, so it's very possible that the, the smaller bowl found at the Neolithic site was not used as part of the curdling process, but may have been part of some other step in the cheese production process. Here's the, the cheese after being removed from the strainer. You can see it's a, a relatively small quantity, but the, the whey drained out quite effectively, and it's a relatively smooth mass of cheese. As was noted in that earlier slide, the earlier image, the cheese remained in the strainer when inverted. Why the hole? Perhaps so that you could push the cheese out of the strainer uh, relatively easily, which in this case um, was somewhat necessary. These funnel-shaped strainers were quite successful in making cheese and straining cheese that was produced at a low temperature with a, a large soft curd. This technique, this form, is not used in other strainers, but it was quite successful following this specific technique. This does not mean this is the only way that it could have been done, but it is one way that did work with this form of strainer. This Neolithic cheese was quite plain. Um, there was no salt used in, in my experiments. Uh, many cheese recipes call for the addition of salt or other flavorings. It's very possible that the smaller bowl was used in the post cheese production processing, adding salt or other flavorings. Um, not likely to have been used for the actual production of cheese curd, but this experiment shows that no other materials such as a cloth lining were necessary for this Neolithic cheese strainer to be successful. The Neolithic funnel-shaped cheese strainer was only good for a very limited range of type of cheese production. It cannot be used for pressed cheese because the form simply would not accommodate it. Uh, it is more like a, a basket form. Like we see here, this is a, a reproduct, reproduction of a Roman style basket, could potentially used for cheese making. The Romans also did press molds and that has a very different form and a different kind of food produced out of it. Roman ceramic cheese molds have been found in uh, a number of different 
uh, Roman sites across the empire. Uh, many of them are the this form with a ridged bottom. There are uh, fairly consistent in sizes, about roughly four inches across, um, some larger, some smaller, uh, but they are found in many different locations. To test Roman cheese production, I replicated a, uh, a generic Roman cheese mold um, with the ridges and the drainage holes. I produced a, like for the Neolithic strainer, a large soft curd uh, cheese, um, relatively low temperature, but given the, the form, um, there's a greater range of variability that's possible with this type of cheese mold. The small, overall smaller number of holes in the Roman press mold means that the, the whey drains out more slowly. You can see here on the, the edge of the mold, the collection of whey that did not drain out immediately. Given a, a few minutes though, the, um, the whey does drain out and you end up with exactly the same kind of cheese you could get from the Neolithic strainer without pressing. The advantage of the Roman cheese mold is that you can press it. Um, and as a result of pressing, you remove a lot of the whey that is more likely to spoil um, over even relatively short periods of time. Um, you just get a smaller product, but more likely to be preserved for longer, longer term use or preservation. Even with relatively high quantities of weight, the, uh, there was very minimal loss of curd through the drainage holes, um, even at the size that they are in the Roman cheese mold. There are a variety of different Roman cheese recipes available. Um, some call for the addition of pine nuts or thyme leaves or other plant material. In all of the circumstances, the pressed cheese came out quite successfully. The, uh, the little nubs would probably be removed. Um, after pressing, the recommendation is to um, cover them with salt, and that would also help dry and preserve them. When we compare the Neolithic cheese strainer with the Roman cheese mold, both of these can be used for straining cheese. However, the form of the Neolithic strainer means it cannot be used for, for pressed cheese. So the food produced from the Neolithic strainers would be a soft cheese with a relatively high whey content. The Roman press mold is a, able to produce a lower whey cheese that you could then preserve and ship to markets at more distant locations. The form of the ceramic vessels used in cheese production has significant implications in terms of the end use of the food. Is it for immediate consumption? Is it for short-term storage? Is it for long-term storage and possible trade? Quite evidently, the Neolithic cheese produced 7,000 years ago was only intended for relatively short-term uh, uh, preservation prior to consumption, where the Roman cheese mold could be uh, pressed, salted, dried, and preserved, and exchanged over potentially significantly large areas of the Roman Empire. Thank you.